So today we're going to dip our toe in the topic of behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. This is a big topic. We could do 20 videos on this and maybe we will, but let me start with what are behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. Now I wanted to do this topic because I have a friend who's a nurse practitioner in geriatrics who works in primary care and she told me the story of one of her patients named Betty who's living at home with some family members and every afternoon at around three o'clock she's getting very very restless and uh, what the family is calling agitated and it goes on right up until the evening and then she has trouble sleeping at night and it's really getting to be a challenge for the family because they all have jobs that they go to during the day and so it's hard to be up at night I'm trying to redirect Betty, make sure she's safe, make sure she doesn't leave the home. Uh, everyone's getting pretty exhausted. And the family is asking my friend for some prescriptions for medications. They're wondering about a tranquilizer to help Betty sleep at night. But my friend is understandably reluctant to prescribe those because of the potential side effects. So this is a scenario that comes up a lot. So let's talk about what behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia are, which ones can respond to medications and which ones do not. So behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia, that's a long mouthful. Let's call it BPSD, or we could say responsive behaviors. Now we used to call these things dysfunctional behaviors or uh, just behaviors. But we've changed the terminology because we didn't want to um, we didn't want to be accusatory towards the person who's living with dementia. It is true that most of the time, almost universally, when there is a behavior that's coming up in a person who's living with dementia, it's because of an unmet need. Now those needs aren't always obvious and sometimes they're not reasonable. But they are needs and so if we look at the behavior from that point of view and try to discover what those needs are, it's easier to work towards a solution. So let's just look at a list of what some of the common uh, behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia are. Now if you're living with dementia or you're a care partner, I don't want you to look at this list and, and think that that's going to be a part of your dementia journey. It may not be. 75% of people who are living with dementia do have behavioral and psychiatric symptoms at some point. Apathy is actually the most common symptom, but not everybody has that. So just because that list is there, it doesn't mean that that's going to be something you experience. Now, some of these behaviors can get better with medication, but some do not. And so, it's important to only use medication when it's appropriate and when it's likely to be effective. The overall approach to behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia is to do the ABCs. So to try to look at the antecedent or trigger. And the best way to do this is sometimes to keep a journal or a log, or if a person's in hospital or long-term care, sometimes uh, there can even be a behavioral chart. But basically it's looking at when a behavior comes up, what's happening before that. So in the case of Betty, is it a time of day when she's been alone for a long time? Or is it when she is about to have a bowel movement and she might be feeling very uncomfortable? Uh, what is it about that time of day and that situation that might be a trigger? The B in ABC is to actually describe the behavior. So instead of just saying agitated or restless, uh, try to try to you know figure out exactly what it is. So is the person pacing? Is the person looking for something? Uh, is the person rummaging around? Are they trying to leave? What exactly is the behavior? And that might help to understand what the goal is behind that behavior. The C is the consequence. So however you handle that behavior, what was the outcome? So if the person with dementia was yelling and you yelled back, um, or you turned on really loud music, what happened? Did it work? Did it not work? Did things escalate? 
what was the consequence? Doing an ABC sort of dissection of what is actually going on around a behavior can be very helpful and very revealing. And it can help to determine what the behavior actually is and figure out the next steps. Now there are two main approaches to BPSD. One is non-pharmacologic measures and the other is medications. There's a couple of reasons why we prefer to use non-pharmacologic measures first, or at least in conjunction with meds. And the first one is that they can be more effective. So as I mentioned, there are some behaviors that don't respond to medication. So using a non-pharmacologic uh, regimen is likely to be more effective. Another reason is it can also be safer. So for example, um, a tranquilizer or a benzodiazepine can increase the risk of falls and in some cases, hip fracture. Um, antidepressants can increase the risk of falls as well. Antipsychotics, so uh, major tranquilizers like quetiapine, olanzapine, or risperidone, they can actually increase the risk of death or stroke. So I'm not saying we never use those medications, we do. And we always try to use the smallest dose possible for the shortest time period possible. We try to determine what's the goal of using that medication. So is it to improve sleep? Is it so the person will be quieter? What's our goal? And give that medication a try. And if it's not meeting that goal, then stop it and try something else. So the non-farm uh, options are much less likely to have some of those concerning side effects. So going back to Betty, when we actually looked at the antecedents to her behavior, we found that the time of day when Betty was getting um, anxious and worried was when everybody was coming home from work and being very, very busy and everybody was kind of tired and cranky. And I think Betty was picking up on those vibes and um, in turn was getting, getting restless. That was also a time of day when Betty was kind of getting ignored because everybody was doing their own thing. In Betty's case, the family was able to secure a spot in a congregate dining program for people with dementia. So that four days of the week, she was able to go uh, from 3 to 7 p.m. To, to an adult day center, have a meal, do some recreation. And by the time she got home from that, she was pretty pooped out and she was ready to sleep. And in the end, they didn't need to use tranquilizers or other medications. There were still some difficult times, but uh, for the most part, most of the time, it was going better. So we have a lot more to talk about, about behaviors. And um, I'm certainly interested to hear what you would like to hear about those. I'm not saying that medications are never appropriate. Oftentimes they are, but they will probably work better in conjunction with some of these behavioral or non-pharmacologic approaches as well. So feel free to share your experience and let me know what you want to see next. I'll see you next time on The Wrinkle.